Mark, thank you uh, so much for jumping on and, and doing this. I, actually, we've had a little bit of preamble chat, but I was thinking this is probably the quickest turnaround for me from messaging someone going, do you want to come on to, yeah, I think it was like Wednesday I messaged you and then and then it's like, yeah, it's Friday. <laughs> so here we are. So thanks for doing it and doing it so quick. No, it's a pleasure, mate. It's good to be on and uh, like say, um, yeah, you caught me at a good time. I had uh, a bit of free time on Friday. So yeah. Uh, excited and uh, looking forward to the chat. Now, most of our chat is going to be around nutrition and, and a lot of what you do now. Um, but I think we've even touched on some topics around both of our sports where they're at football and cricket and and social media. And, I, and we can dive into that. But I think just for those listening who may not have, have come across you and your, your path, it'd be good to know sort of where football started for you really like what what was the journey in and what sort of sparked your your interest in it and 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 passion yeah so I was four years old when I got my first pair of football boots and uh you know from that age really my mum and dad were obsessed with football they loved it and uh I wanted to be a professional footballer from a really young age and um I was basically I was training two, three times a week in a, an academy from four or five year old and uh, just loved it. It is mental. So I was, I was just enjoying my football up until the age of 13, 14. I was playing Sunday league. I was having a kick around with my mates, just loved scoring goals, uh, loved trying to learn new skills. So it was amazing for me. And then I got spotted at 15 uh, by Burnley. And then I went on to do my YTS from the age of 16 to 18. Um, this is a long story, by the way. <laughs> I'll try and keep it as short as possible. But um, yeah, from 16 to 18, played some really good football. Um, played with some good footballers in my um, in my youth team. We had Jay Rodriguez, who has had a great career. Uh, Chris McCann, Kyle Lafferty. So we had some really good players, to name a few. Um, and at 18, uh, due to a change of manager um, with the first team, I got told I wasn't good enough, got released. And, um, yeah, I just thought, where do I go from here? I've got to get myself back out there. And at 19, I played 43 games for Bury. I I got given an opportunity, had a really good season, and then from there went to Shrewsbury. Um, At 22, I was told I wasn't good enough due to a change of manager again. Um, I was on my honeymoon at the time, so that was a bit of a kick in the teeth. I thought, I've, I've you've got a wedding to pay for here, getting released again. My wife was obviously thinking, what do we do? And I'm like, I'm going to play in the Premier League. You know, I'm really big on affirmations, um, positive self-talk. I think belief's a massive thing. You need to believe in yourself. And I always believed I was going to play in the Premier League. So two days later, I got a phone call from Hereford saying, we, we want to take you on a year's contract. And that season, uh, I scored three goals against Bournemouth, two in the home fixture and one in the away fixture. And uh, they took a real liking to me. I scored 13 goals that season as well. So it was a, it was a good good tally for a left winger. So I was chuffed with that. Um, Bournemouth signed me after that. And I spent nine amazing years and rose up to the Premier League with them. Spent four years in the Premier League. And uh, it was an amazing journey. And then um, I went to QPR for a season and then uh, finished my final season with um, going to Shrewsbury for three months. And then... Here I am now. I mean, that is a that's a whirlwind of probably putting packing in your your what, eighteen years of, of football in there. <laughs> you sm- yeah, I tried smashed, doing it as quick as possible. Sm- smashed it out in about a minute. Um, but I I actually want to go back to when you were mentioning there about change of managers. I think that's something, especially people in in football. And do you know what? In any sport, like there's obviously chopping and changing um, staff and people like that. But in football, it's 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 is severe like it is it is drastic how do you navigate that space when you are being told by someone new that you're not good enough having been told you were good enough by someone else who's kind of from an equal position of i guess stature and 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 level of authority like your your coach has essentially got you've gone from saying i am good enough to now being told you're not good enough and you mentioned self taught you mentioned self belief does, does it just come down to that? What what allowed you to navigate that period of, of your life? I think you've got to be mentally bulletproof, especially within the profession of, uh, of football. You uh, you really need to, yeah, I mean, just believe in yourself and believe you are good enough and um, 
just, I always say to myself, right, if someone tells me I'm not good enough, I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm going to do it in the right manner. I'm going to be humble. If you think I'm not good enough, then that's fine. That's not everyone's opinion. Um, what's important is your opinion of yourself. When you look in the mirror, if you know you're doing everything in your power to be the best version of yourself, then you will come good. I always believe, you know, I've got a quote which I, I pin behind my mirror and it's hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And I've mm. lived by that. It's really important that you always go in to everything you do with confidence. And um, you, when I, was, when I was told I wasn't good enough, I always believed I was. And I said to my wife, you know, I'm going to play in the Premier League. I am. And she believed me. And having others around you that, that believe in yourself as much as yourself then, you know, it's really important. I think surrounding yourself with positive people when, obviously, you, you have a setback, they'll uplift you, they'll make you feel better about yourself. And life's a journey. You've just got to ride that journey and do the best you can. It's really interesting. I, and I've mentioned about me doing a bit of a workout this morning. I've just jumped off the treadmill. And um, when I'm on there, I'm, I'm listening to some of my uh my lectures and studies around performance psychology and the one I funnily enough was listening to was some studies on self-talk the the it was all around self-talk and really interesting that the studies were showing that positive self-talk didn't have this be all and end all impact on on outcome confidence and performance but what it did do was it kind of blocked negative self-talk so they, they had in these studies, they had two groups or three groups. They had a control group where they didn't really give them any self-talk. They had one who had positive self-talk and then they had another one who had negative self-talk where they made them say negative things about the task they were trying to do. It was like a, a blind throw or something like that. And they then measured the confidence and the performance. And they found that the the people who had no talk whatsoever and the people who had positive self-talk, they cut, they were, stayed fairly the same. There wasn't a massive change. But the ones who had negative self-talk, their performance and confidence plummeted. And it was so drastically different. So I think it's so interesting in how you think about it. Like, yeah, maybe the self-talk, the positive self-talk didn't actually have too much of an impact on it. But what it did do is it blocked out all the negative self-talk that potentially could come along in that moment. And I... I th I've put myself in so many different scenarios there where I've thought, wow, actually there were moments where there was so much negative negativity wanting to come through, but using positive self-talk blocked it and, and allowed that to just get out of the way. And definitely what you've said there about other people, like other people saying positive things, keeping you on that right track is, is so important. Yeah, it's really important, mate. I, I couldn't have said that better myself for sure. Uh, but never get too high with the highs, too low with the lows is, is what I always live by. I mean, uh, you're going to have to deal with setbacks. You know, life's full of hurdles. We've just got to ride them. We've got to, you know, be the best we can be. And, yeah, that's really interesting, actually. I mean, whenever I go out onto football field, if you have a bad touch, you've got to focus, right, my next touch, my next pass. You know, my next cross, my next shot, let's do something productive for the team. Let's make sure it's good, it's on point, because you got 50, 60,000 fans watching you. The last thing you want to do is, you know, not believe in yourself, not show that confidence to, you know, grow into the game and, and do everything you can for your team. And the minimum requirement is that you work hard. I mean, mm. you know, if, if you're having a bad game, if you're not you know, performing to the best of your ability, as long as you can go in at half time, full time and say, you know, I give everything for the cause there. That's, you know, that's all I can do. You can go to bed at night and you can sleep and, uh, you know, you can rest easy. But if you look back and you look back with regret or, you know, I didn't quite give my all then, you know, it's, it's really difficult to, um, you know, have a good night's sleep after that, in my opinion. Yeah, look, football's so fast-paced. Is it really easy to dwell on moments that have gone wrong? So I, I go and see the odd sort of non, non-league non game at the moment and I've got a couple of clubs that I work with locally. And I have seen, and, and again, it's probably the difference between a Premier League footballer and, and, and that level, is that when something bad happens, they, they could miss time a header miss time a challenge get get beaten or something something 
negative happens in the game very quick because obviously the next moment's going to come along. But uh, you tend to see them dwell on it a little bit or they get frustrated. They tend to then come into the next challenge maybe a little bit too hard and they actually end up getting their yellow card and then they're on the back foot for the game. And is it is that a real important part of being able to sort of park little moments to 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 move on i guess is what i'm trying to say is just get get through that little negative burst and then just park it and move on is that a, a big difference between lower leagues and and higher leagues i mean there's going to be so many different other aspects but is that is that an element is what i'm saying i think it's massive i think it's massive um the mind is so powerful um obviously you've got to be physically in really good shape i mean the top level athletes are physically, mentally, emotionally, they're all in the right place. And, uh, yeah, I think uh, you look at your top top players, especially midfield players, De Bruyne, whether he makes a mistake or not, he's getting on the ball, he's showing for his teammates. I think I've found that, obviously, say uh, you're a defender and you, you make a mistake or you're a striker and you miss a chance, I think the best always put themselves out there. They They always want the ball. They never hide behind a man because it's the easiest thing to do. Oh, I'm not going to make an angle to receive the ball again if, you know, I've made a mistake, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, the mind's really powerful and um, not having negative thoughts throughout the game. Like you say, the, the game is so quick, so fast-paced, and if you're not on it at all times, it can eat you up, especially at that top level. So, um, like I say, Physically, you've got to be on it. You've again, it goes back to your mind. I always used to say, I'd come up against the fullback, and I'd be right. right. I'm fitter. I'm fitter than you. I'm stronger than you. And how can I get the better out of you? So you've done all your your analysing previous to the game. You've you know his strengths. You know his weaknesses. Use your strengths to beat him at his game um, mm-hmm. and find out his weaknesses. So I used to always do that and I used to sort of play mind games. I mean, you know, there's times I've got a, a, a picture I really like. I mean, uh, I was winding uh, Middlesbrough's full back up at the time, Fabio, and uh, he came up, gave me a load of chip, trying to kick me. So I just held the, the four fingers up because we were four nil up. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, Obviously, you've got to be humble in victory, humble in defeat, but uh, you've got to show that real arrogance and confidence that that you are good and you deserve to be there. Yeah, that's a fine line, isn't it, between that arrogance and confidence, like having that self-confidence in yourself and and not doing it to, I guess, diminish. There's competitive natures that you get on the field and you don't, you obviously never want to take it off the field. And I've spoken to many people on the podcast about the person and the persona and when you cross that line, you're, you you can be, a, I know that I was a completely different animal when I'm crossing the line, like I change, but then when I'm off, like I'm either apologetic in what's happened on the field and I, I'm, I'm like, look, there's no hard feelings. It's nothing against you. I'm trying to do the best for my team to get us to win. And that's because that's the, the goal of why I'm here. Like that's the challenge. I'm really interested. You mentioned about 50,000 to 60,000 people and, and I've not p- played in front of pe- that amount of people before. Um, it must be super tough to not get drawn into being very self-conscious about the way you do things in moments because you've got a lot of eyes on you. You've got a lot. So how do you drown out that and, and kind of keep your ego in check when when there are so many eyes on you? Yeah, I mean, um, I've got a really great family around me and I knew no matter how I, I played on a Saturday, on a Tuesday, whenever it was, I could go away and I could block football out of my life. I, I concentrated on my family life. I think it was really, you know, refreshing that I could just go home and whether I played well, whether I played, you know, not so well. Um, I didn't read too much in social media what people was posting. Um, I think that's a big thing in modern day football. I mean, especially at the top level, if you have a bad game, there's so much criticism out there. So being able to block all that out whether you play well, whether you don't get too high with the high, too low with the lows, like I spoke about, just being yourself. But when you're out there, you've got to, I mean, you've, re- you've got the nerves before the game, um, the atmosphere, the build up to the game. But once you, you know, you've kicked that first ball, you've taken your first touch, you forget all about it. You're, you're in the zone. You've just got to crack on with the game and, Go back to the training sessions, the practices you've you've done previous, and implement them into the game. And 
I know how good you are. So again, it's back to belief, back to confidence and just making sure you implement the strategy strategies you've worked on throughout the week and get the better out of your opponent. So, um, you know, at that time, it's great when the fans are cheering your name, when, you know, they're behind you. But how do you deal with that when they're against you? So it's having that fine balance between being um, in the moment and just doing everything you can to, to achieve success at that time. Yeah, I, I like that, that, that compartmentalising of your your sport as well, recognising that when you come off the field, your family life, and you, you sound like you had a real good stronghold on that. Social media, I think, we're both similar age, and I, I count myself as a bit of a blessing that, I mean, I started in 2010, and really, I mean, Facebook was three, was three years old then, so... Yeah. Um, Twitter again, finding its fee, Instagram, don't even know if it was around, but I just kind of count myself pretty lucky that with all of my, I guess even my story and my my upbringing and, and I didn't have games where I would come off and, and see massive negativity around it. I mean, the, the sport is not as publicly seen as something like football. And I, I mean, people who are watching the news around football at the moment, it both of our sports are in not great places in the, the public eye. And it is down to a lot of things that happen on social media. And I, I think the education around young players now has got to be so strong in making sure they just know good good habits for not only making their public and their brand persona look good, but just keeping themselves feeling good, like making sure that they're just being good people. And I hope that the clubs and the, whether it's the PFA or even the PCA in cricket, really make a move on just education, like early doors. I think even when we we did some, some education stuff, when Twitter was kicking off, like they really scared us. Like they actually genuinely scared us. We had, we had people coming in who had like trawled through posts of ours and they would scare you into creating these fake news articles. And you were like, my God, I actually don't want that to ever happen. So now when I go out, I'm going to make sure that I'm aware. And, and you've got to be hyper aware now. Like There's just eyes and cameras on you. And then times that by 20,000 if you're a, a Premier League footballer. It's, it's just hard to navigate. I, I almost don't even know the answer sometimes. Yeah, no, I mean, um, I'm exactly the same. I, I started and... Um, there's none of this on social media and social media is such a powerful tool. And if, if you're using it to add value and, you know, help others and, you know, create, create your own platform to sort of encourage others to be the best version of themselves. I think it's really powerful, but when obviously there's negative comments on there and, um, you know, you're putting silly videos on just for a laugh, it can come back to bite you. Um, mm. Like you say, the PFA do speak, a lot about it you know you need to be careful um of what you're posting at all times and it's really important because everyone's looking for a story and you don't want to be that story and you don't want to come in the press to, to be a bad person because life's full of good people and all these good people you know people who have got a bad name maybe in the press they're actually really good people they just need to be educated a lot better yeah, I I love your positivity coming out of it. I think football needs more of it, that's for sure. Um when you uh, when you finished the game, what was that period like for you that that kind of coming out? You played a lot of Bournemouth and then you finished at QPR. Um what what was that period like for you because it is I actually don't know if you've seen this thing at Crystal Palace that they recently announced. Crystal Palace I, I don't know whether they're the first to do it and I I I really hope a lot of clubs follow suit is that they created a, a academy or a um, basically a, a program for when players finish the game or even if they're in an academy they're going to educate them and nurture them back into normal life and they, it's like for 20 people who are or maybe even more that are in and around the game and they're not just thrown out of the sport and they're just like lost to the game because there's you you've had your career like you've gone all the way to the the far end you've had a long sustained career but there's obviously 
I mean thousands that don't even get to that stage hoping on a on a whim that they'll get there um and that's probably another story in itself but what was the navigation of of the end of career like for you now that's absolutely incredible what crystal palace are doing i think there should be a lot more of that um yeah i've, I've got a lot of friends still in the game funnily enough that <laughs> are really scared to come out because they don't know what's after football which is really sad I was really fortunate that um, when I was at QPR, I always loved food, but eight, nine years ago, I couldn't boil an egg. Um, <laughs> and my missus did a lot of the cooking. But when we had our second child, it, it was my way of trying to help out because we you know, we were six, seven hours away from family in Bournemouth and our family was up north. So um, <laughs> that was my way of helping out. And then I just, when I was 25, 26, when we um, got promoted to the uh, championship with Bournemouth, I thought, how can I gain that extra edge? How can I improve my performance? So I started to study nutrition. And the more I implemented it into my game, the more like, I felt better physically. I was running 12 to 14K a game. Um, I was recovering better. I felt so much better about it. So I studied it more and more and more. And then when I was at QPR, I set up my Instagram page just because I wanted to help people. I wanted to encourage them to live a healthy lifestyle eat the right foods, avoid the foods that are going to you know, have a negative impact on recovery, performance, cause inflammation in the body. So, mm. yeah, I just thought I'm doing something I love here. And then the more and more I did it, the more and more I loved it. So um, yeah. getting messages saying, you know, you've really helped me lose weight or um, you've encouraged me to eat healthily. It really, I, I found like I'd felt my why. And in my final season with QPR, I only needed to play one more game to get a new contract. And then COVID hit and they said, look, we can't afford to play you for this one game. Because, um, we can't afford to keep you on the same wages you're on next year. So I was like, all right, OK. Um, so I left QPR, didn't um, get to play my game. I had no contract, no club for about, I think it was about five months and then Shrewsbury came in in November and uh, gave me a contract for three months. Um, so I played the first month, um, played really well, scored two goals, got three assists, I think it was. The manager got sacked. <laughs> so, so, yeah, story of my life. And then uh, the, the manager who came in was uh, Steve Cottrell. He released me at Burnley when I was 18. Uh -huh. um, so he was the first team manager. And, uh, yeah, I didn't really play um, again after that. I had one or two games. And then I just look back and I believe everything happens for a reason. And um, this pushed me into the nutrition side of things, what I'm doing now. And um, I probably, I'd have probably tried to prolong my career till I was like 40 years old if, if something like this wouldn't have happened. So having a negative thing happen in your life, to being able to turn that into a positive, I think it's really important. Um, you know, I lost out on a lot of money with that year. I could have had a QPR and obviously I went five months without a club, but I always kept the faith that something good was going to come out of this. Um, and I'm absolutely loving what I'm doing at the moment. I've got a lot more flexibility to my life because football, as, as everyone knows, mm. is full on. It's 10 months, boom, you you know, you can't plan anything. The schedule changes quite regularly. So, yeah, I mean, um, going back to your question, um, I found the transition a lot easier because I felt like I'd found my why and I felt like I had my, my new passion in life. Don't get me wrong, I absolutely love football. I'm still playing three times a week, five a side with my mates, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But I get my football fix and, uh, you know, I'm loving my <laughs> life at the minute. Must be horrible playing against you on a five side. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, here, here he comes. Um, I mean, you're definitely a success story in this in this regard. There will be, I, I mean, the sad that we would want to get to a place where there, the ratio is in the balance of more of people like you and less of it being the other way and people coming out and, and not having an idea. I, I'm five, I'm five years nearly well yeah it'd be six years this year out of the sport and and really for me this year has been the first 
yeah, the last few months have really been the first time where I've galvanized like what I'm about. And, and it's been many different ideas and it's been many different. I kind of know the path that I was going on. And again, it's really, be, it's really, I understand that why and I know what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Um, but I think that for me, it's been the galvanizing of, of all of these things coming together and actually being able to be confident in saying that I'm no longer an ex cricketer i'm actually now a founder i'm a mind performance mindfulness coach a mindset coach for athletes like that is i'm more confident in being able to say that first than than the the former cricketer first um and and i think the more we can have people like you telling these sort of stories in football cricket rugby golf whatever it might be I don't know about you, but it, it allows the sport to become easier as well because you haven't, you're not fixated on everything around the sport. Not everything is about that bit of training or that, what you're eating, or or it might be in your case what you're eating. But definitely, <laughs> like the training and where you're going to be, your schedule, like you said, it doesn't consume you as much when you have something else to focus on. Yeah, mate, it's really, really powerful because, like you say, I'm I'm so pleased that you found what you want in life because after sport, after professional sport, it's really difficult to to fall into something when someone of uh, you know of they've thrown all their energy into you know the profession. Um, I mean, I always try to have that balance and and focus on something else as well. I think it's really fresh. I mean, I know players playing at the top level. You look at um, you know, I know him really well, Tyrone Mings. He's got businesses, you know, as well. He's got his co. He's got like coaching uh, kids. He's got um, interior design company. So he's got things going on outside of sport as well. So he's um, he's got that balance right, and people can do it. You look at Marcus Rashford. He's he's doing so much for you know people in the community, and um, getting that balance is really key. So. I mean, I'm I'm really blessed and fortunate that I have I have got that and I've been able to transition really well. But like you said, there's a lot of people that do struggle to transition from the game, whether it be cricket, whether it be football. But I think there does need to be a lot more support uh, for these kind of people. And it's really sad, but there's a lot of mental health issues within the game. Um, and a lot of them are probably behind closed doors as well. So... Um, it, you know, it's it's a big part of the game, and uh, we really need to help these people overcome their issues. That's for sure. Yeah, I I went into, like I said, work with this local uh, non-league team, and they had. I basically went in there, and I was there to teach them uh, meditation, breathing exercises, and a bit of yoga just to to help them out. And, and ultimately, my goal with all of that is to combat stress. Now, whether that's stress in your body, stress in your mind, the physical, mental, and emotional stresses. And I sat there in front of them, and they, they obviously have a, a preconceived idea of what these methods and practices are about. And when they saw me coming in as a six foot three athlete and sort of wearing a baseball cap, and they're like, this is a bit different. But my first question to them was, well, I actually told them stories about my experiences, like I had played games where I felt incredibly anxious and it had been a bit of a car crash of an experience. And then I said, how many of you feel anxious? And there's kind of like a little murmur and I'm like, raise your hands. And then everyone raises their hands. And it and it's, you're right, it's this unspoken, but when you're, when you tune into that like moment with them to go, no, no this is real guys, like you're aware of this, this is real. How many of you have felt like, worried about a performance after before or after like how many of you are dwelling on something past the performance itself and how many how many of you then take it into your home life and your your next game whatever it might be and sure the hands come up and then really interesting when i i gave them when they signed up for my app and uh, the sport yogi app and they are using that and i've now just got some feedback from them after a few months and hearing the, the comments around, yeah, the physical part is helping me be on the pitch and I feel better with the recovery, but the mental side, the actual, the being able to have self-confidence and, and the self-worth and the, the re reduction in anxiety, like that's coming through. And even some of the most loudly spoken players that were in that, you know, the guys that are in the group, the, the yeah. loud mouths, the ones that are really cocky and, and those guys who you think, oh, maybe they're not going to take on this method. They're the ones that message you and go, 
I've been doing these breathing exercises and they've had a massive impact on just calming me down before a game or taking that moment to take a breath before I have a penalty in front of hundreds of people. And that stuff is really rewarding because, and, and I that's my goal is to get into helping teams like that and, and being able to, this mental health, again, pandemic in itself within sport is uh, <clears throat> is, its own, is its own ball game. And I'm sure you've seen many, many, many different sides. And and like you said, people who have those outside passions, those people like Marcus Rashford and Tyrone Mings, those they have a lot of negativity coming towards them. But again, it bulletproofs them because they have that that sort of overarching sense of who they are. Yeah, hundred percent. And it frustrates the life out of me when uh, you see people putting you know negative comments on the internet towards Marcus Rashford if he's had a bad game or oh, well you should be focusing on your football as opposed to doing what you're doing outside of it which is completely wrong because it's not going to affect his football he's just mm. trying to make the world a better place which is is really key and going back to your yoga, yoga and meditation i think that's amazing because when you hear positive feedback and you're helping someone you know, it, it makes you feel fulfilled. It, it gives you a why, like we spoke about earlier. It's really important. And uh, I'm a big believer in yoga and meditation as well. Um, it's a great way to um, bring positive thoughts on. Um, again, you can, you can tie it in with your, your affirmations, your uh, visualization, and uh, you know, blocking out them negative thoughts. Um, you know, it brings yourself back down to earth and you, you feel so much better about your day, yourself. And it, it's a great way to either start the day, end the day, or if you feel a little bit stressed from work, or you know, take yourself away from your computer for 15, 20 minutes. That's all you need. It's not a long time. I mean, a lot of people say they haven't got the time. I'm really busy, but you know, you can do a 15, 20 minute hit session. You can do your yoga, your meditation, um, you know, cold therapy, get yourself in a cold mm. bath that awaken <clears> you up. And <throat> uh, you know, just doing, you know, Improving the small percentages, as I always speak about in your daily life, by just, you know, taking 10, 15 minutes to, you know, make time for yourself. A lot of people, because they're so busy, we don't make time for ourselves and uh, we need to, you know, sit back, relax and, and um, you know, do something for ourselves as opposed to running around after everyone else, whether it be your boss, whether it be kids, whether it be... Yeah, um, I, I say to my wife all the time, you know, take take that time for yourself because you're busy trying to help everyone else. You need to look after yourself, your your health, your mental health, your physical health, whatever it may be. I think it's really important um, that, that you do that on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. Let's let's get on to food. That's that's let's let's talk about food. So you said eight years ago you couldn't boil an egg. What was your diet like as a young young pro? It wasn't horrendous, but it was um, it was made up of a lot of white pasta, white rice, bread, mm-hmm. all these types of things that <clears throat> aren't really nutritious. I mean, to this day now, I always say avoid the whites and, and go for the whole grains and, and the browns and that kind of thing because they're just stripped of the nutrients. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it wasn't bad, but again, I'd reward myself after a game if I played well with a Chinese or an Indian and it was just adding to that buildup of inflammation after a 90 minute game. And then I'd be wondering why they're not recovered properly for the Tuesday night game. So yeah, it was just those small percentages that I need to improve, you know, whether it be including more fruits in my diet, more vegetables, more lean sources of protein, um, you know, not having your, as much red meat, that kind of thing. So um, again, it wasn't bad, but it could have been a lot better. Do you- would you have had i mean you would have had a lot of food put forward to you in in professional scenarios like we we were fed probably two to three times a day um as, as in a pro setup and I, and I think football has, has got way more than that i think you have a lot of resource so was it did you have a lot on on kind of given to you without necessarily knowing what you were doing I mean, in my early days, because of what financially, when I was playing in League Two, League One, the conference, um, we didn't get lunches, breakfast, mm. that kind of thing. We'd get the odd lunch here and there, maybe on a Friday before a game, but it was up to us. And then rather than preparing, rather than, you know, doing your overnight oats, rather than, um, you know, meal prepping in the evening, 
he'd be like, yeah, let's pop to the garage on the way home and grab, you know, a sandwich, a pasta, that kind of thing, without really putting too much thought into it. Because when I was younger, there was nothing out there, like you say, there's no social media, there's not enough on the internet where you can really educate yourself. Um, we were never told what to eat. So you had to, you know, take it upon yourself to to do the right thing. And we were always told pasta, rice, bread, you know, get it, get it down. You get the carbs in you, which it's, it's the wrong way to do it. Um, and like I said, when I started to educate myself a lot more, uh, got that extra string to my bow, as, uh, as they say, I think, you know, improving the small percentages on a daily basis, whether it be having my ginger shot in the morning, which I religiously have done for mm. eight years, just for the immune system eating loads of fruit, which have loads of antioxidants in, which help the body recover more efficiently. And, you know, having the right amount of protein and carbs and healthy fats as well. So it's getting that balance. You know, we don't want to go on all these fad diets that, you know, are short-term fixes and aren't going to be beneficial to your health long-term. We want to have that balance. We want to feel good. We want to, you know, obviously you want to look good from the outside, but it's really important that you feel good from the inside as well. And uh, yeah, over the years I've learned to, you know, know what my body needs and um, it was able to, to take my body and, and my performances to the next level. So when let's talk about that. So when you sort of moved into, again, educating yourself, mm. uh, there, there's a difference between educating yourself and then actually putting it into practice, obviously. Mm. So when you put it into practice, what were the sort of things that you started to see, feel, um, yeah, in your body and I guess even in your sort of mental cognition. Yeah, I mean, I noticed from the ages of especially 19 to 24 that I used to get a lot of brain fog. I'd, I'd, I'd not be able to focus for long periods of time. And I guess that was because I had too much dairy and gluten in my diet. Um, I really cut back on my gluten and dairy um, and I don't have much gluten and dairy at all. I have bits just, you know, to keep my microbiome ticking. But the biggest difference was I used to get to around 70 minutes and I used to be blowing out of my you-know-what. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, really struggling with that for that last 20 minutes. I'd felt great up until then. Um, but when I started to put things into practice from the age of 25, 26 onwards, um, I could go for 90 minutes again. I, I could look at my opponent in the eye. I, I was like, I'm fitter than you. I can run all day. And it's just by getting the right amount of carbs, you know, minus one game day, game day, not obviously going into the games feeling bloated because, you know, when I was younger, I used to just eat until I was full and I felt a little bit bloated, a little bit lethargic. So, um, yeah, that was the biggest difference. I could go for 90 minutes. Not only that, my recovery rate was so much quicker and I have, I wasn't having my takeaways. I was going home. I was having a nutritious meal of either salmon, um, sea bass, your, your chicken, your turkey with vegetables, sweet potato, whole grain rice, whole grain pasta, that kind of thing. And it helped me recover so much quicker. Um, so yeah, I'd say the recovery rate and performance was, was so much better. And, and you hear that in football, in a lot of sports, especially, um, who was it? I think it was Tuchel who was talking about how quickly Chelsea had had to turn around recently. And you think it must be so easy to come off after 90 minutes or even if, let's say, you've gone into extra time and you've you've had 120 minutes of, of, of football, you have... Mu you must... It must be so easy to want to grab something, I don't know delicious in the sense of it being a uh, I don't know fast food or something like that or something really non-nutritionally dense and in a good way rather than doing something in that first 24 hours that sets you up for the next three days I I, I even saw that through the ability to do things like stretching and yoga like get that done and doing my breathing to reduce the the stress in my my nervous system if i can do that in the first 24 hours if not better the first 12 hours of that recovery it at least makes you mentally feel like you're starting to do the right thing rather than come back from a game grab something really easy maybe really high in saturated fat or or really sugary 
and be like, oh, I feel good. Ment- that's had a gr- good hit because I feel like I've deserved this. But then actually it's trying to get it back, the, the whole <laughs> treadmill back up and running again to, to get going for the next few days. I, I don't know where you kind of lie with that. Yeah, I mean, sugar's um, an absolute killer on recovery. I mean, I see all these energy gels, um, you know, that the the footballers are putting in before games and stuff, but effectively they're going to get a burst of energy for 15, 20 minutes and then they're going to hit a crash. So it's like a sugar spike and um, it's, um, yeah, I mean, avoiding these sugars, refined foods, processed foods, it will have a massive, massive effect on your recovery. And I think it's, it's so important that we include like healthy fats, carbs, protein into our recovery meals. I mean, I always focused on getting a protein shake within 30 minutes after my game, just to try and get that recovery process moving. And then within two hours, getting, you know, a good nutritious meal with plenty of veg, you know, I loved fish after a game because obviously omega threes, omega sixes, great for, for inflammation in the body. Um, and the, after, there's been studies shown that if you include um, a good protein source with carbs after after a game, then it can improve the recovery rate by up to 150%. And I mean, if you ask me, I'd choose that over a takeaway any day. <laughs> yeah. So what would you say to a young footballer who might ask, mm. what do I have in the lead up to a game, whether it's the day before or even the morning of? Yeah, I mean, every every individual is different. Every individual has uh, intolerances and, and things that work for them. I'd say to them, don't change too much um, leading into a big game, but try and implement strategies, whether it be pre-season, during the week, of different foods before training to work out what works for you. But in the lead up to a game, I mean, you know, go for your... You don't need too much protein three, four hours before a game. You've got to mainly focus on your carb intake, but make sure it's good carbs, your complex carbs, which are going to fuel your body, um, you know, for su- sustained periods as opposed to just getting that quick hit. So things such as sweet potatoes, quinoa, brown rice, brown pasta, um, jacket potatoes, that kind of thing with a small amount of protein and then a little bit of veg. We, do, we want to try and avoid too much protein and too much fiber because in the build-up to a game mixed with the nerves, then you're going to get maybe bad stomach ache and you might spend a lot of time on the toilet. So it's trying to get to the bottom of what that individual needs um, depending on the weight, the height, because they're going to require more carbs for performance. Um, so like I say, it's not a one-fits-all uh, sort of regime. We've got to get to know what, works well for our bodies yeah i i agree with a lot of that i don't know if you've done much sort of elimination it sounds like you eliminated things like dairy and, and gluten and i'm assuming you had those to begin with but i've personally found a, a great understanding through trying things like ketogenic diet i spoke to um a guy called so i've had zach bitter on the podcast now zach has has or had the world record for 100 miles the fastest person to run 100 miles done it does it in sub 12 hours it's insane and zach is has a carnivore diet so zach runs on but what he does talk about is his metabolic flexibility so his ability to the reason why he has low carb days is because he needs his body to learn how to actually utilize fat. Now he's going for a serious long time. Like he's he's doing a sustain. He's way over ninety minutes. We're talking here, and he's having to metabolize fat as an energy source because he's just not going to be able to get all of that that cut that instant sugar that that um, the simple sugars to get in to to sustain him for that long. So he needs everything complex, and he needs to go to that high fat monosaturated that has huge amounts of of energy density within it and he then would say when he's actually racing before that he actually switches to them bringing in things like carbohydrates because it's like topping up the tank and it's teaching you and there's peter ratia who has the podcast drive and i really recommend his episode with a guy called inego milan who they talk about uh the mitochondrial health and inego milan works with people in tour de france and and riders like that and he talks about essentially having two engines 
if you think about your ability to burn fat as your diesel engine, but then your carbohydrate using carbohydrates as like your petrol, you're going to go for longer with the diesel engine. But if you want to go that little bit more performance, you need to have the ability to utilize the carbohydrate that 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 petrol engine and that petrol tank. And it was such a great analogy because I thought, do you know what? I put so much on this petrol tank and going carbs and and really having this belief that if I just loaded up on carbs that I would have all the energy in the world but actually like you said I crashed and then more dangerously had that mental fog and that for me is one that you can't necessarily claw back too easily once you've done all the things that have put those wheels in motion when you're playing sport. 100% it's all about balance and uh, once your glycogen stores of uh, you know the diminishing then they do, you do, like you say, um, get into your fat stores and fat is a massive source of energy. Um, you know, your healthy fats such as your avocados, chia seeds, mm. olive oil, um, nuts. Um, there's all sorts of different things you can eat. Um, obviously, before football, you can't eat too many of them because they're high in fiber as well. So you need to be really careful. Um, it's It's such a wonderful topic because... Everyone's different. Like I cut dairy and gluten out because they, since I did, I end up dropping like five, six percent body fat. Um, it it made a huge difference to me, but that might not be for everyone. I mean, I, I know a lot of people are um, they get on really well with dairy because you know it's a good source of calcium or whatever it may be. But it's um, it's not. It affects me negatively, so I cut that out. And it's important that we. We don't get caught up with the latest study, you know, because Mm. loads of carbs, carb loading might not work for everyone, like you just spoke about there. Um, It's it's getting that balance, and like early on in the week, I think if you if you're not having as many carbs just for your training, and then implement them towards the end of the week when you're coming up towards game day, your body will use them a lot more efficiently because they won't be used to the same routine. I think it's important we. We try to keep our metabolism guessing um, and introducing new food groups and, and different strategies into our daily life just so it keeps it fresh, just so, you know, and, and keeping track of what we did well, what we, where we went wrong, I think is a massive part of it. If you're having something before training that really energized you and you think back, oh, what was that? And then try it again. And, you know, you might find your hidden formula. I mean, it might be that small percentage that takes you to the next level. Yeah, that metabolic flexibility definitely something that people should uh, should explore. So, if you had a, what are some of the common problems you perhaps see with with young athletes at the moment when it comes to nutrition? What are you what, what are you kind of seeing out there that you might say are common issues? Um, too many uh, quick and easy meals. Really, I'm just going to go to the um, to buy you know packet of crisps, processed foods biscuits just to they don't fill you at the end of the day it's, it's important healthy fats uh, you know uh, they're really filling protein really filling so i mean it's just that preparation to, to spend an extra 10 15 minutes in the kitchen preparing your meals for the next day i mean it, it's really important but yeah i think quick fixes are the ones and um you know reaching for the snack cupboard too much and uh, having processed foods and it, it drives you mad sometimes because that can be the difference between, you know, you recovering and not having that buildup of inflammation in your body. Um, but as all of us, we're learning. We're, we're all learning. We, we don't know everything. And there's new studies coming out every day. Um, we don't know right from wrong sometimes. Yeah. But we just try and do the best we can and educate each other Um you know, to become the best version of ourselves. And um, if we can sort of bring in the good, more good habits and bad habits, then it'll make a big difference over time. I think there's so many people get caught up in that kind of being being in a one type of form of diet and it like carnivore, vegan, omnivore, what and, and, and having no gluten, whatever it is. But at the end of the day, if you you're so right, if you can, my, and this is my opinion as well, is that if you genuinely just look at like, okay, is my diet consumed with processed foods and and non non natural foods? Can I improve that by going more towards the natural route in whatever dynamic that might be for you? And I'm 
sure as hell you're going to see a difference and i would also act, and i'm sure you've seen this and uh, this will be a question about the difference between going from league two league one championship to premier league is that the the mental ability and consistency that it requires and, and strength that it takes to say no to that food to say no to that quick and easy thing and then do the right thing in in my opinion ingrains a mental capacity to transfer that into your training into your 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 skills and that hardens you that might be the difference between making it at a certain league level to then going even higher yeah i think it, it makes your body more more robust as well i mean when you're doing your gym work you're going to get stronger you're going to get fitter you're going to feel better you're going to be able to lift more weight you're going to be able to run that extra you know one kilometer two kilometer whatever it may be it makes a huge difference and not only that i always especially when i um you know learn a lot more about the topic I didn't just fuel myself for that one performance. I looked for the longevity. There's a lot of people that just fuel themselves for that one performance and just want the sugar. You know, I want to get through this game. I want to be the best I can be. But it's going to have a detrimental effect on your health as well. I mean, sugar is one of the biggest causes of cancer. And, Mm. you know, there's all sorts of... It's not spoken about enough, actually. There's a lot of products out there that are marketed to be healthy. I mean, you look at your low-fat yogurts you take the protein and the fat out and replace it with a load of sugar. So it's, it really needs to be looked at and people need to be educated on how to read food labels, how to, you know, do the basics really well. And the world will be a lot healthier, happier place. And, um, I mean, a lot of the me- mental health issues as well. Sugar's a major factor in that, you know, for, you know, fluctuation of, it causes your cells to, to play havoc and all that kind of thing. So it's it's really important that we we can all learn from each other and not just fuel for that one performance. Um, make sure you're fueling for recovery and your mm. overall health and well being as well. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. Seeing it as a more holistic feature f- for your for your performance and and yes, your well being as well. I don't know if you've come across Tim Spector and his book Spoon Fed. Tim Spector started a company called. Um, or he's recently well, it's not recent. Zoe is the company, and they're fascinating. But he wrote a book called Spoon Fed, and it debunks a lot of those myths, like how to read food, like what's going on in the the consumer market, and what these corporations are trying to say to you, and actually what the food is all about. So if anyone is keen to find out how to navigate the open world of food, like his book Spoon Fed is is unbelievable he actually ended up getting um called in by the government to head up the covid response team for for health and he um he's fascinating to to listen to the thing i i think as well when going through your instagram page at the at the foodie footballer i i noticed the food looks delicious as well and i think that sometimes can be something we lose sight of in in sport is that we see few uh, food and I was down this food as fuel I definitely fell into this trap where it was give me that that meat salad whatever I don't care what it looks like get it in me it's just got to do its purpose whereas I think a lot of the stuff that you're doing is there it, it helps you enjoy the food that you're you're eating and and I and have that I guess satisfaction from from eating the food yeah, definitely. I like to present my food really nicely and uh, use as much color as possible. And, you know, you, your vegetables don't have to be plain and boring. You, there's nothing better than roasted vegetables and, you know, a little bit of honey, a little bit of, you know, Italian herbs, garlic, mm. um, bit of chili. So, I mean, it tastes absolutely beautiful. It's as good as having a steak sometimes when you have a good, good lot of roast vegetables. So, um, I mean, just making it look presentable and enjoying what you do as well i mean there's that much information out there especially online different recipes different marinades to really jazz your food up and even with baking i love baking but we don't need to use all our flours refined sugars we can replace our flours with oats we can replace our sugars with maple syrup honey that kind of thing and let's go for the you know 70 percent cocoa or above dark chocolate as opposed to your milk chocolate or white chocolate so it's just making small tweaks and you know um 
it will have a massive impact on the way you feel, the way you look, whether it be your skin, whether it be, you know, the way you feel on a day-to-day basis. It will make a huge difference in the long run. You might not see it over two, three weeks, but over, you know, two, three months, I think that's the problem. We don't see the quick transition, so we give up. So it's important to stay consistent, to, to stick to, you know, you, what you believe in. And um, I think it'll go a long way in the long run. That's such a good point And actually, so true. I had this morning, one of my clients messaged me because he had been struggling with energy slumps and things like that. And, and I got him, to, and, and most of the stuff I've been doing around him was his, his mental side of how he works. And, and he's, a, he's a business owner. He's a CEO, founder. And um, he has like, these high stress levels. It's a really big business that he works for. And I said to him, okay, just do me a food diary. Just just literally, there's so many apps that you can track what you eat. Just write down everything that you're eating. And he was only eating um, 1,200 calories in the day. And he's like, I can't understand why I'm not losing weight. But the calories that he was eating were probably, I mean, if we're talking, he was high sugar. Ultimately, it was high sugar. It was a lot wow. of sugar in his tea. It was a lot of like yogurts, granolas. And, and, and even though they kind of seem like they're healthy, you actually added all that sugar up and you look at the physical grammage of like what he was eating, the sugar was the highest. So I'm thinking, sitting there going, well, sugar being an infl- in, um, inflammatory substance, that's just going to block a lot of what we're trying to achieve here. Let's not eat less. Let's eat the right amount, drop the sugar, take it out. Now, here was the interesting part. After four days, he goes cold turkey. And he's he's pretty much miserable. He's almost aching, and and he's I want to give this up. And I'm like, just hang in there. Just honestly, just just keep going. Just we know that dropping sugar and bringing in more nutritious food is not a bad thing. Like there's enough studies and enough people out there and case studies to know this is not the right thing. And it was really easy for him to say like, well, it's it's my cortisol. It's it it, it could be so easy to jump on something else in that moment and go, it's not the food. It's this. And he's just texted me this morning going, you genius, I've just dropped two and a half kilos. It's the first time I'm below this weight. I feel more balanced. I feel more, my energy's come back. And I'm like, there it is. It's not that quick fix, as you've just said. It's just breaking through that mental barrier and going, I'm just going to play this out. I'm going to play out this, this scenario, just that week, two weeks more and see where it takes me. Because it's so easy to drop it. It's so easy to to go back to old habits or blame it on something else and not see the result and go back to old habits. Oh, amazing. So you're his guru then. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it was, I was just like, there was so many different things we were trying and, and, and we'd, we'd, yeah. done some, we'd done some breath work and improving his breathing. We'd added in some meditation. We, uh, we'd done some stretch. We'd done some basic yoga to like open up hips and reduce tension in the body. But there was still this overarching stress in the, in the system so I was like, well, it has to, the food is like what we consume is what we are and it's got to be food. So just show me what you're eating. And I, and I don't have a, I have enough knowledge in food through my own experience, bit of education and also speaking to people like yourself and, and some amazing experts and to know that sugar is just the enemy. So it wasn't, it, I mean, I'm not throwing anything out there that is just life is not uh, deep science. It's just, here's refined sugar going in. Let's slow that down. Let's drop that, halve it, quarter it, whatever we can do. And we're now seeing a result. Yeah, amazing. And 1,200 calories is really scary because you should never eat below your basal metabolic rate. And no one's metabolic rate's that low. Mm. Um, we should always eat above um, especially with physical activity levels, so he's going to be in, he's going to be so deficient in so many vitamins and minerals eating that amount of calories. Not only you know adding the sugar to his body, so I mean, I bet he's going to feel so much better the more food he keeps adding as well. As long as he's, we always focus on you know we've got to focus on the whole foods. Um, and I always say if, if there's um, something you're going to buy that's got over eight ingredients and two or three of them you don't understand or can't even spell don't buy it i mean yeah. there's there's so many products out there that like we spoke about claim to be healthy and they're really not and they're processed and uh, are highly processed that kind of thing so um no that's amazing and uh 
again, it's uh, just improving the small percentages, um, whether it be adding more food. I, I mean, I did a post the other day on um, some of my athletes I work with at the moment. They don't eat anywhere near enough because every day in training, they burn about 1,000 calories. And some of my athletes are only eating 2,000 calories. And I'm thinking, that's a 1,000 calories that you're eating basically in a day, which mm. we need to be eating a lot more food, but let's eat the right food as opposed to just, you know, eating for the sake of eating. You, you feel more full when you've had a breakfast of something like eggs, avocado, and, you know, a nice piece of sourdough as opposed to just grabbing some quick sugary cereal. You don't feel full. You don't feel fulfilled. And mm. obviously the, the, you know, the first breakfast is going to fuel you and, you know, make you feel better about your day along with providing the body with, you know, the vitamins and minerals along with fiber that it needs to um, to tackle your day. I guess it's also not, I guess it's also saying that it's not a case of not having treats as well. Like you can have that. It's it's just zooming out and looking at the overarching s- schedule of what's going in. That, that I guess is the, the important part. Like it's not about cutting out anything that's excitable and and i love i love chocolate i love biscuits like i just but i'm not having them every day and i'm and i'm reducing and i'm fortunate that i love really really dark chocolate like because it's great for antioxidants and it's just great for brain cognition and and i'm fortunate in that way but i don't gorge myself on a bar of it every day that's it's it's just consistency and yeah that whole overarching schedule being good yeah, it's really important, and like you touched on there, dark chocolate's incredible for the body. Um, great for recovery, great for inflammation in the body. Um, if you get in a, a good quality one, obviously seventy mm. percent or above, not too high in sugar. And there's actually been studies shown if you get hundred percent cocoa and and make a little hot chocolate with uh, maybe a bit of plant based milk and uh, touch of maple syrup, that it can lower blood pressure. Um, you know, if you're having two cups of it a week so yeah uh another little tip for you there if, uh, you i might give that a go <laughs> i might give that a go for sure i like my oat milk as well so yeah nice. but so your work right now I'm, I'm really conscious of time and and taking up too much more of it but your work now let's talk about your work and and who you're working with uh, and i guess even what people can expect if they want to come and work with you yeah, so um, I'm a health coach and um, I'm helping people whether they want to gain weight, lose weight, um, improve athletic performance, um, improve lean muscle mass. Whatever their goal is, I want to try and do everything in my power to help them. So I've got an app which um, I provide nutrition um, and fitness plans. And the nutrition plan uh, also includes all the recipes, all the amounts of different foods to help them achieve the goal, along with the uh, the workouts. They'll have videos with them as well. Um, and then we can keep in contact on a daily basis. I'll obviously um, be my usual positive self to try and encourage you on a daily basis, whether it be we haven't spoke about it yet, but hydration is you know, one of the yeah. most important aspects of you know, being able to help the body absorb nutrients a lot more efficiently. So it's just helping them understand the bodies a little bit better and, um, you know, help them achieve the goal. So, yeah, I'm doing that. And then I'm also going into um, to clubs to try and educate the young players, um, you know, help them fuel performance and uh, reach optimum performance, so to speak, and help them with recovery. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm working with Bournemouth at the moment, uh, so I'm really enjoying that. Um, it's been it's been a, a good challenge, and uh, you know something I'm loving. Are you still living down in Bournemouth? Are you still located there? So no, they wanted me to come down when I relocated up north. So it's a nice five and a <laughs> half hour journey. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, you. Then let, let's talk about hydration. Like that, that's um, that is something that I am dreadful at. I have to conscious constantly nag myself to get. Uh, I almost have to get electrolytes in. I did. I did a bit of work on knowing that I, I. I have essentially more salt lost through my sweat. Some. I know some people don't. You lose loads of salt through that your sweat. Some people do, and there's different variants, uh, varying levels of that. Um, but yeah, let's talk about the importance of hydration and and any tips that you can give in how to for athletes especially to to stay on top of it. Yeah, it's massive. I mean, um, 
you, you know, when you feel dehydrated, you feel absolutely horrendous. I mean, every morning when I wake up, I make sure I leave my pint glass by the kettle. And every morning I'll have um, either lime or lemon water with um, either sea salt or Himalayan pink salt. Um, because obviously you lose salt in your sleep. So I make sure I down that before I do anything else, uh, a pint of water. And then throughout the day, it's there's so many benefits to it. It helps your immune system, especially with a lime and a lemon. Um, helps your body absorb nutrients a lot more efficiently. Um, can help with nausea, can help with you know your digestive system. Um, so it'll help you digest food a lot more efficiently throughout the day. So it's a great way to start the day. And um, I always make sure I have at least two to three liters, sometimes three to four if I've like played football in the evening. So um, it's really important. Like I'd encourage people to buy, do you know, one of the bottles you can buy with the amount you've drunk throughout the yeah. day, keep it with you at all times and just keep sipping. Um, it's massive for bodily functioning. You know, our bodies are mainly made of water really. And, mm. you know, to, to for concentration levels, you know, our brain, it's massive. It is really important for all bodily functioning. Yeah, uh, I can't I can't echo that enough. Uh, look, last last question. It's a question I commonly ask people: is was if there's a documentary, a book, a person, a quote that you recommend the most, uh, what would it be? Oh, good question. So Ed Milet's fantastic. Is he done some great podcasts um he's really positive he's absolutely brilliant so i'd encourage you to follow him on instagram and, and listen to his podcast i'm reading a book at the moment called dr william he's dr william lee don't know whether you've heard of him and it's eat to beat disease um and right. i'd really recommend give it a read he's absolute it's um he speaks about angiogenesis um you know immune system bodily functioning and um, basically, he is, uh, is a doctor that uh, works with blood vessels. And um, he, he did a degree for four years. And for one month of that degree, uh, they only spoke about nutrition for, for a month, um, which is scary. So he twisted it and he tried it's because he was working with, um, you know, medication and prescribing medications for different, um, you know, clients and, and uh, patients. But then he thought, well, how can we stop these diseases happening? And then he, he focused on the food first approach. And uh, it's really, really interesting. And he lists a load of foods that can help with various things, uh, reducing the risk of cancers, um, improving performance, all different types of things. So it's a really, really good book. So I'd recommend that. Okay, perfect. I'll, I'll, we'll get that link in the in the show notes. We'll also put links in the show notes for your Instagram page, Um and uh, and your website and everything that that sends people your way for people that want to want to get in touch and whether that's learn more about their own nutrition put a bit more of a strategy together for their own f food goals and 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 health goals and well-being goals this this is such a an interesting area that I haven't touched enough on in the podcast and I'm really thankful for you giving your time and coming on and being able to to do this so I I appreciate it Mark and and um I'm I'm thankful for having you here no, it's a pleasure. Really enjoyed it, mate. And uh, yeah, no, thanks. Uh, you're doing great things and I've enjoyed listening to your podcast so far. So no, all good, mate. Thank you so much.